welcome to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff and maker culture. Tonight, I'm your host, Joe, and joining me are... Aaron. And... Dominic. Yeah. So, tonight we've got a super fun episode. You notice that the second voice wasn't Christian. <laughs> we have... Um, that was Aaron. You know, <laughs> the third voice was not Christian. Yes. Yeah, the one after me. <sighs> um Dominic, let me go let me let you introduce yourself. Okay, great. Um hey everyone, this is Dominic from Darkly Labs. Um here in Australia and uh, happy to be talking with the guys tonight. Happy to have you. Yes. But I want to clear one thing up real quick. So, Dominic, you say you're in Australia. Right. Does that mean you are not in a secret government bunker, either in Colorado or on the ice wall, defending the border of the edge of the world? Uh, no comment. <laughs> you know, I don't really believe him, Joe, because his video was on earlier. He was right side up. <laughs> I, it's kind of tricky when we talk... Um, to the states because everything flips upside down here and it's it's really awkward so if you hear me out of breath it's just me trying to hold on to the table <laughs> <laughs> yeah nothing's right there your toilet's been back it's <laughs> summer there uh. <laughs> sorry i I'm just we got I can't that out of the way got out right? of our system yeah, we, 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 we may have to cut hole. that i've got some i've got some nasty looking guys um, giving me some <laughs> dirty looks. So, yeah, we might have to cut that bit out afterwards. <laughs> they're, they're doing the throat cutting gesture. <laughs> exactly. S sending the guys to my house now. He knows too much. Now, for people that don't know, there's a, uh, a flat earther theory. And if you really want to be entertained on the internet for like an hour, just Google flat earthers. But that Australia doesn't exist. And everyone that says they're from Australia are government actors. And they're they're defending the ice border, <laughs> and that that theory it kills me. I love it so much. All right, so now that we're on the t the fun topics, uh, what's everyone drinking tonight? Aaron, I actually have a Robert the Bruce from Three Floyds. Ooh, it is a Scottish style ale, and is really good. Nice. Adamic, I know it's morning time for you, right? Yeah, it doesn't really matter. That's we we're, we're fine with that. Um, today I awesome. have a, a James Squire, the Swindler Swindler Tropical Pale Ale, and apparently Ooh. it's an easy drinking pale ale with a big tropical aroma, worth swindling time for. So, <laughs> Excellent, and it's really nice too. Excellent, nice. Uh, me, I'm always one for puns in my beer titles. So I have a uh, beer from Alaskan brewery called Hopothermia. It's a double <laughs> IPA. Gosh. And it's delicious. So, yeah. All right. So let's jump into the topics. So, Dominic, who or what is Darkly Labs? Why are we talking to you tonight? Good question. Um, we're an Australian-based manufacturing and design company, basically. Um, we develop and manufacture the Emblazer range of desktop laser cutters. We currently have around seven staff uh, working with us. Uh, that's both um, assembly and design and, and general office um, sales administration type, type work. Uh, we okay. sell through a, a worldwide distribution network, so we... Um, basically make, design um, the machines, build them, and we have uh, distributors all over the world who go out and do the hard work and, and get it in front of customers. Awesome. So why did, why, why did Darkly start? Well, it was, um, it was way back in 2012, 2013, where this guy had an idea about making a low cost laser cutter for hobby use. Um, okay. that was, was that guy you, that was me. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, so we decided, like like every um, everyone back in those days, the best way to test the market was to put up a Kickstarter campaign. And um, we came up with a prototype. We did some testing. We put it up, and we thought, hey, at best, if we could sell you know fifty to a hundred units, um, get a little bit of pocket money out of it, maybe even um, score a three D printer out of it, that would be awesome. <laughs> Um, but things didn't turn out exactly that way. We, uh, the campaign was really successful. Uh, we ended up taking um, probably over 800 orders and um, that totally changed uh, our whole way of thinking and we basically had to start a company up to meet um, that production yeah. and that sort of demand. Wow. So I, that brings up something that I've been wanting to ask somebody for a long time. Like, when you... When you start a Kickstarter with a plan of making, you know, thirty or fifty machines, and then all of a sudden you're making hundreds of machines, do you have the ability to turn off orders in Kickstarter or turn off backers and say like, no, no, enough's enough, or, um, or would you have even wanted to do that? I don't think you can do that without stopping your campaign. Um, someone may correct me on that. But you, you really don't okay. want to do that. <clears throat> you want to get as much um, get as much funding as possible, because inevitably yeah. you've always underestimated how much money it's actually going to take you to make the product. Right, right. And it, but it seems like a lot of the failed Kickstarters, especially for machines like laser cutters and three D printers, it, the failure seems to stem from over committing like you know you know how to make 30 or 50 machines but a lot of these companies when they have to scale into even a thousand machines they just get overwhelmed and they don't know how to deal with that level of scale um and the machine isn't designed to deal with that level of scale so how did you guys deal with that it was a tough one actually that was probably the one of the biggest problems we had we our initial machine was um, a kit it was um 99, uh, 90 percent 3D printed, and um, the rest um, laser cut. And um, as you know, scaling up 3D printing is really not the right way to um, to run a production company. Right. So uh, we basically, um, after we got over our panic, we went out and bought a bank of uh, 3D printers to at least get the machines going. Um, right. And we we really just had to, it really just came to man hours to, to meeting the demand. We didn't have time at, in, at that point in time to go in and redesign things where we would get things injection molded or, or get it manufactured on a larger scale. So we were really, for the most part, playing a big catch-up game um, with trying to get these machines out. Uh, that's changed since then uh, with, our, with our newer machine. But it's it's a real tricky one, and we, you know, along with some luck and um, working, you know, eighteen hour days and um, having printers in your living room uh, where you can sleep, and then all of a sudden, in your sleep, detect filament getting clogged or running out in a printer, <laughs> and mysteriously wake up and change that. Um, it's it's a really tough thing to really tough thing to do, and I can see how. Looking back on it now, I can see how we were very lucky in a lot of ways. We had some really good, committed people working with us, and um, it basically came down to to that to get us through. That's uh, yeah, yeah. I I completely understand what you're saying with uh, you know, waking up mid print to to fix things. Like <laughs> 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 waking up and being like, that doesn't sound. <laughs> exactly right it's amazing how you can sleep and your brain can still be thinking about stuff isn't it yes yes it does do you have anything aaron i was actually going to ask the scaling question too because oh, I've, nice. I've always been interested myself with how people handle overly successful uh kickstarter campaigns so that well, i'm glad you asked that those seem to be more common than not like everyone's like, yeah, I'm going to make 20 of these. And then they're like, Oh no. <laughs> so what, oh what, no. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's, it's a big one. Um, one thing we did was we, we could afford to 
by larger quantities of materials. So in a sense, we could get the cost down on material purchases, and then that money could go into the extra manpower we needed or, or people power we needed to, um, to actually put in the hours to get that going. So it kind of balanced itself out a little bit. Um, you do, there are some benefits, but for the most part, um, if you don't design a product to scale up easily or your business isn't designed to allow for scale up, um, you can be in, uh, in a world of hurt very quickly. Yes. So my next question. Um, so, so who is Dominic? You know, what's your background? Uh, what are you interested in in your in your daily life? Um, you know, a lot of our listeners are, you know, they're just normal people that want to make things and you know might want to start a company, but you know also are, are machine designers and builders. So it's always fun for everyone to hear about the people that are really successful in what they're doing um, and how they kind of got there. I can give you a 60 seconds, um, 30 seconds, uh, 60 second um, download if you like. All right. Um, it's, basically, it started when I was a kid. I just loved disassembling things, seeing how they worked. Um, my grandparents used to, um, I didn't realize it at, at the time, but they jokingly would give me something like a broken clock or a TV um, set or something and say, hey, do you, you know, it's broken. Do you want to go ahead and fix it for us? And inevitably, I'd end up dismantling the whole thing into every single minute component that was in that thing to see how it all worked, and then ended up with um, a bin full of, um, you know, <laughs> a bin full of bits that would never go back together. So, it, oh yeah, my man. <laughs> <laughs> we have the same grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> so. It just was something I had in me very early on. I ended up, um, in the 80s, I ended up um, completing a mechanical engineering degree because that's what I thought I wanted to do. I wanted to do mechanical engineering because they make stuff, right? Um, right. But unfortunately, after after the degree, I realized that your general mechanical engineer is it's a pretty boring job. Um, it's pretty rare that you land a job as an engineer where you're really into creating um, and developing and refining things, especially in Australia at that time. So I did like anyone else would do. I kind of floundered around for a few years and all the way um, along, I was, I'd always been interested in computer graphics. Um, so computer graphics in films, um, special effects, those type of things. Um, and I ended up buying a, a computer and a copy of a software package called Lightweight 3D, which... I don't, you guys may not have heard of it, but it was a um, it was a program by New Tech back in uh, back in the day. Quite a quite a um, a neat, affordable three D graphics package, and I taught myself how to how to create computer graphics. Um, this was back in the late eighties, early nineties, when you just couldn't go to oh, university wow. and do a, a computer graphics course. It was those things just didn't exist, so you had yeah. to. Um, kind of teach yourself, talk to people, um, kind of learn learn along the way. And it worked out for me because I ended up getting, a, you know, ultimately getting a job in the UK and then worked in Hollywood for about 10 years on uh, feature films and TV commercials. Um, and that was just such a great, great time working in LA um, with a number of yeah. uh, companies like Digital Domain, um, working on some of their feature films and it was a great learning experience and eventually I got that out of my system and moved back to Australia and once again luckily just kind of landed into a dream job. Um, I started talking to a company here called the Creature Technology Company and they make large-scale animatronic creatures so we're talking life-size dinosaurs for arena shows um, nice that's so cool 30 30 <laughs> foot mascots for the Sanchi olympics we've got a um a king kong um animatronic creature in the florida um universal studios kong ride um and it was just such an amazing um company to work with and they <clears throat> they excuse me they ended up bringing me on to develop their digital department so it was kind of like a perfect 
blend of my uh, mechanical engineering skills and experience and my computer graphic mm-hmm. skills. And, oh boy, it was just such a, you go to work every day and it's just looking, it's like a new day. There's toys everywhere. There's little mechanisms. There's people putting together electronics. There's engineers designing structures. It was just such a fun place to work. Um, and it was there that I met quite a few clever people, became friends with quite a few of the engineers and the work people there. And we ended up forming a, kind of like an after work group where we'd all hang around after work okay. and kind of brainstorm projects and use all the equipment that they had and, and um, experiment and play around with things. And one of those projects just happened to be a laser cutter um, that we just started talking about and throwing ideas around. And that kind of, you know, kind of gets us to where we are with um, the Kickstarter campaign we started up. So, okay. yeah, it was a little bit of an indirect um, career path, but um, I don't think that's so unusual for people. No. No, especially your beginnings are so familiar. Um, it's it's really fun to uh, to talk to different people like you and find out how how common the thread is of oh, yeah. like how we get to where we're at. <laughs> yeah, I always like so. to tell um, people starting out that uh, you you can do your your courses and your degrees. You can be really good at that sort of that sort of um, stuff, but. Um, usually what makes really significant um, differences in your life are the, are the hobbies and the things that you you kind of do for fun and you have a real passion for. Um, yeah. And, yeah, it's definitely been, um, been true to my career. It's just these things that I've always been interested in and just mucked around with um, have kind of stepped in at, at the right time and really helped me um, move forward in, in, in my career. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I tell people a lot that the last four jobs I've gotten or promotions that I got had nothing to do with my professional prowess. It had everything to do with the weird stuff I did after work <laughs> and, and we, just we being have, able to talk about that. Yeah, we have a classic example of an engineer that was being interviewed at um, Creature Technology Company, and there was four engineers, and on paper they they were all perfect. They were interviewed, and they were all perfect. They, you couldn't find a fault in any of them. But one of them um, was really into photography, and he he did these amazing um, time lapse photographs of, of beaches and oceans and um, skyscapes, and and him riding his bike into work and all that sort of thing. And he showed us that one day, and it and it just put everyone completely over the edge. It's like, yep, this is the guy we want. Uh, this is the guy that's yeah. going to fit in and, you know, give us a little bit, something a little bit different. Um, so, yeah, as I always try to encourage people to just, you know, keep, keep your hobbies up, right? Even if it, it's, it's difficult most of the time because of time constraints, but um, it definitely makes a big difference. Yeah. Yeah, a friend of mine that runs a, uh, a, a CNC equipment company, he doesn't even ask people about their their professional background in their job interviews until the very end. Now the, the very first thing is what do you do for fun? Yeah, if we weren't here and you had a day off, what would you be doing? Uh, and just feels them out that way. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually how I got my uh, job at cat currently it was uh, the architect that interviewed me. Uh, I had pretty much the same, you know, resume that every other developer has, but he, but he saw that I was, you know, volunteer vice president for the makerspace like oh so he asked me what i did there and i talked about you know at the time i was working on that an open source raspberry pi baby monitor project and like all this other stuff and he got super interested in that that i'm like messing with linux in my spare time and like tinkering and trying new technologies and stuff and that's really what put me ahead of everybody else was that i'm willing and able to try out and learn things in my spare time and have fun and be passionate about something so yeah yeah, definitely. Passion is passion is really important, and it's unfortunately it's not something that you can teach. It's it's something that's within you, and I think every, everyone has it in some form or another. Um, yep. And it's yeah, it's quite important. So, what are you passionate about, Dominic? 
Oh boy, if you'd asked me before I started this company, <laughs> that would be a very <laughs> different answer to, to what I tell you today. Um, look, quite openly, it's, it's so much work running a business and, and growing it and keeping it going that <clears throat> the, for the most part, it, it pretty much consumes you. Um, at the moment, <clears throat> excuse me, at the moment, Darkly Labs is my passion. It's, it's what takes my mind in, in all directions, nearly 24 hours a day. And um, it's exciting and it's scary. Um, we have opportunities that come up and you, you go for them. And, and it's, it's pretty cool because you, you can actually go for them. It's your call. You know, it's my call um, as opposed mm-hmm. to working for someone that, um, you know, you have to get approval to do that. Um, so the business is my passion at the moment, um, although I do look forward to the day when I have more time to to do other things, <laughs> other more fun things, more <laughs> creative, more creative in terms of um, hands on making things. Right. Well, if you weren't doing Darkly, what would you be doing? Good question. Uh, am I am I infinitely rich, or is this um? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think I, I'd still I I'd still be in I'd still be in this business in this industry. It'd either be um, doing some sort of design or uh, involved in some sort of manufacturing or um, process or, or company or business that that makes develops um, different products. So I, th- I think it's kind of still where I'd be at if I was independently um, wealthy and didn't have to work another day of my life. Uh, I'd probably just be buying stuff like CNC machines and um, <laughs> massive laser cutters and wire cutters and um, water jet cutter and just kind of setting up a massive workshop where I could wake up in the morning and say, hey, wouldn't it be cool if um, – if I could uh, do this and uh, walk into the workshop and have everything there at hand that, and, and knew how to use it, um, that would let me do that. It would kind of be a kind of be a kind of fun way to retire as well. Yes, that does sound like so a you'd, dream. You'd still be making stuff. Still be making That's stuff. Like Absolutely. Yeah, I, um, my coworker and I are always talking about how when our stock is worth like a million dollars a share at the startup we work at or like a thousand dollars a share, how we're going to retire and then just have our own shop where we can still be the grumpy old machinist guys, but you know, make the stuff we want to make. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Hey, and then, uh, you know, if your shares are that much, you can always pay people to come in and make it for you too, right? (laughs) No, they wouldn't do a good job. (laughs) No, that takes a fun out of it, doesn't it? They wouldn't do it right. Yeah, you know, even if they did it better than me, it still wouldn't be right. No, no, you've <laughs> got to do that. You've got to make fifteen versions of it before you you, you get it right, and then you you look at it and you go, "Damn, that that that's good." You know, I learned that, and I I yeah. I, I conquered that. Yes, yeah, uh, oh, man. So, um, this is this is a fun conversation. Um, the if we're if we're sticking with my topics, um, so the M Blazer, tell us a little bit about the M Blazer, cool. and uh, and how you guys got to the where you are today with the E two. So we we started um, with the M Blazer one, which was um, the Kickstarter campaign. It was a kit. It um, it was a solid state laser system we decided to go with um, because it was um, reliable, it was easy for us to control, didn't involve massive voltages and and, um, uh, safety um, dealing with high voltages that a CO2 um, system would include, would would involve. Um, It was also um, uh, affordable and, and, and easy for customers to put together as a kit. The, the Blazer one was a kit, so people would have to buy that and um, assemble it and then get going on it. Um, and we, it, w- it was really successful. We still sell the E1 um, to this day. And we have 
thousands of them all over the world. We have them from Australia to the US to deep, dark Africa um, in the middle of um, extreme temperatures to places in Europe to Asia. They're, they're all over the place. And we learnt a lot from that machine through customer feedback, through how it was used, through issues, um, through the whole the whole process. We we basically drew, um, you know, we were able to basically put a product out that gave us feedback from from a, a very wild, wide worldwide audience, and we took all that and um, we made the Emblazer two, which um, is not a kit; it's a fully um, uh, assembled machine. It's a class one laser product, which means it's safe to use um, without any protective um, equipment, protective eyewear. Uh, you can just sit that in a classroom and um, have primary school, um, preschool kids interacting with it completely safe, safely. It's, mm -hmm. we, uh, we made it very, very um, simple to maintain. So one of the things we noticed with our E1 was that when something goes wrong, um, you know, people don't want to have to send a machine back to base to have it fixed. Um, so we, we incorporated a lot of things in the Emblazer 2 that makes it very simple for the end user to replace. Um, the, the laser diode, for example, when that needs to be replaced, um, the user takes out four screws, um, pops out the old laser diode and pops a new one in. Um, it's really it's a, it's like yeah. a two minute it's a two minute job. Um, there's no realignment. There's no mirror correcting. There's n none of this um, complex thing and, and and safety things with a CO two laser that need to take place. Um, and basically, it's it's um, it's it's just taking it the the E one to the next level. We we have a, um, a workspace camera in there. We have so users can place a piece of material on the workspace and see that on their screen on in, in the program and be able to align their designs. We have um, an air assist system in there um, built in, so you can achieve very clean clean cuts and help um, alleviate any small flame ups that may happen. Um, we have automatic height adjustment, so. Once the users have calibrated their machine, um, they can basically put any thickness of material in there that they that they decide to use, and the software will take um, will basically set the laser height to the correct height. Um, so, just just naming a few there, you know, we really just kind of amped it up and tried to make it as simple, as safe, and as 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 reliable and easy to use. Yeah. Yeah, so I actually looked at the uh, unit Joe has, and I think your Z-axis is brilliant. It's just yeah. so tiny and compact. Oh, thank you. And it does the job so well. They inspired me to kind of design my own belted Z-axis. Because I was actually working, I was going to start to design my own Core XY motion stage diode laser, but never got around to it. But then Joe's like, you know, I've got this M blazer here. It's everything that you're trying to do. <laughs> Already done. <laughs> <laughs> they just copy it. Yeah. Um, hey, we, we went through a lot of um, design work with that Z stage. We we looked at worm drives and um, all sorts of bits and pieces, and they all had their their merits. And actually, some of some tech, some um, approaches that we came up with were better, but they were more difficult and more expensive to um, implement. So we went with that very simple geared um, geared. Um, Rail, uh, rail and carriage, and um, drive that through uh, uh, the geared stepper motor, basically, um, with a very high gear that's ratio, a, and it, it that's works a really tiny well. geared stepper, isn't it? It's tiny. Yeah, it's it's, uh, little, it's, it's yeah, 150 to one ratio gear. gear Holy boxing. cow! Yeah, I didn't realize it was that. Yeah, I mean that's tiny to be that <laughs> geared. We had to do that to. Um, those motors are really small, so we had to do that to yeah. make sure that it could um, reliably not lose steps while it was being moved up and down. That's yeah. awesome. If you ever get a chance to open up one of those gearbox gearboxes, they're just an amazing piece of work. Inside, they're all brass machined metal gears. It, it's 
it's like a little miniature um, wristwatch in there. It's just incredible um, at how hmm. the things put together. Well, if, if one ever fails on me, yeah. <laughs> I'll take it apart. <laughs> Yeah, so full disclosure, guys, I have an Emblazer 2 uh, sitting in the shop uh, behind me, and um, it's uh, it's been one of my favorite tools in my workshop, and it sits right next to my 100-watt CO2 laser, and I use it just as often as I use my CO2 uh, because they do different jobs. And honestly, the Emblazer does a lot of the jobs that my CO2 does way better. Um, so, Joe. The, M- the Emblazer does them better. Why would what? you use a dial blazer over your fancy, fancy uh, CO2 laser? Well, I'm, I'll let Dominic talk to some of that. But I will give you guys a, a really good reason why, if you were looking at buying one versus the other, I, I just experienced this. I just bought a brand new CO2 laser for work because uh, I needed a very large um, uh, build area and I needed high speed cutting through uh, thick leather and thick woods. But even though I spent about $10,000 on the CO2 laser that I bought, I still had to spend a day and a half aligning it. And, um, you know, it's a Chinese laser, uh, but even when I spent $80,000 on an epilogue laser, when I built the, or not the epilogue, a, a universal laser, when I built the cat maker space, they still sent a guy to spend a day and a half aligning it. So you know, just because I paid somebody doesn't mean the work didn't have to happen. Um, but when the E2 showed up, um, I I had Dominic ship it to my work and it it came and I cut the box open and I set it on the desk that the FedEx guy brought the box and set it on. And then we turned it on and I pushed go and it cut things. And it was amazing. (laughs) Amazing (laughs) that it just worked. (laughs) I was so happy. But you don't know how, how happy that makes us uh, makes me here. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, four of the guys at the makerspace uh, that work with me were there with me, and you know, we're all like, "Well, what are we gonna have to tweak to get this to work?" Because we've bought lots of machines and we've set lots of things up, and we just push the power button, and I hook my laptop up, and we cut stuff, and it was so fun <laughs> to just let it work. Um, but it, Dominic, why would we buy a diode over a CO2 or, um, can you talk a little bit to that? Sure. Now that uh, I've ranted a little bit. Absolutely. It's a, it's, a, it's a really good question. And look, w- when we first started making these machines, we had no intention of competing with a CO2 laser at the time. Um, you know, the cost differences between um, a diode laser and a CO2 laser was, was, was big. You know, the Emblazer 1 was 850 bucks for the kit, and the cheapest CO2 laser, um, not including um, Chinese brands, you, you know, you're looking at a, a few thousand dollars, um, sometimes even 10, 15 grand. So it was a different, it was a different market space when we entered it um, back, back um, in 20, 2014. Uh, since then, it's changed, and there's a lot of there's a lot more competition out with low cost uh, CO2 machines. So, it it's a funny question. Although we never intended to have to compare the two, we we always have to compare the two these days. And look, I'll I'll tell you the way we see it and why we still plan to stick with diode lasers uh, in the future. And there's some advantages and disadvantages between the two. The, mm-hmm. One of the advantages is a diode laser is compact. You have um, <clears throat> a very, very small footprint of both electronics and laser um, stuff that you have to deal with. Uh, it's a very low maintenance. You, you, have, you don't have your um, water cooling system that you need to take care of and um, your mirror alignment and your, your flying beam system that you have to keep aligned and keep clean and 
thing. It's, it's reliable. It's a solid state device. Um, if it's treated, if it's, if it's um, treated well um, within specifications, it'll last you a, a long, long time. Um, yeah. And also, uh, diodes have a very linear power range, which means that when you um, when you ask for five percent, you get five percent. When you ask for fifty, you get fifty, and when you ask for hundred, you get a hundred. Um, CO two lasers tend to have a little bit of a uh, more of a curve on their power range, which means that when you're trying to access lower ranges of power, so for example, if you're engraving uh, a photograph. Um, your, your laser really, you, you lose a lot of the bottom end uh, with a CO2 laser as opposed to a diode laser. So, and it becomes a lot more amplified at higher wattages too. Ex- exactly. So some of the limitations, yeah. there's some of the basic advantages. Uh, the limitations are power, laser power per cost. You... It's still cheaper to to install a laser tube for high power. Um, you know the the watts per laser tube cost is much lower than the watts per diode cost. Um, CO two um, systems work on a different frequency of laser beam. They work in the near infrared range, which means you can engrave and cut transparent materials uh, you can engrave and cut different colors um, these are some of the limitations with laser diodes there mm-hmm. they work in a, the the diode we use works in the in the blue light frequency which means um, it'll just pass straight through transparent objects uh, like transparent glass or trans or a transparent acrylic um, and also being blue it's less effective on blue colored materials so there's, they've both got their um, pluses and minuses. We personally feel that for our customer base, which is uh, we do a lot of work with um, education, schools, um, and um, you know universities, those type of um, education facilities, the advantages for them often outweigh the, the limitations. Um, to have something that is very simple to maintain and use and um, educators don't have to um, be um, trained up um, uh, to a large degree makes a big difference. Um, the fact that it's compact, you can pick it up and place it in a classroom um, and then pick it up again and then place it in a, in, in a, in a, um, a storage room and not have the mm-hmm. misalignment go out. Um, is a, is a big deal as well. So, and I can uh, attest to that because we take my E two to Maker Fairs and all the shows <laughs> that we do, and um, yeah, you know, it just I pick it up and I set it in the cab of my truck, and then I pick it up and I put it on the table and I hit power and we go, and we don't have to worry about cooling, um, and we still have to worry about fume evacuation, but that's relatively yep. simple. You don't have to worry um, about blinding people. Yeah, we don't have to worry about blinding people because it's a class one laser. It is class Unlike one. Like the jerk that was uh, that built an SLS for glitter out of a blue laser <laughs> and put a clear acrylic <laughs> enclosure over the top of it. Oh gosh! Oh my god! Yeah, that yeah. was at Rep Rap Fest this year. <laughs> I'll tell you so something. I've got one. Oh, sorry, no. Go ahead, Aaron. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was gonna say I have one of those, you know, one point five watt LX Maker engravers that I'm borrowing from a guy who brought it to the makerspace. So I've been playing with it and upgrading it and making it work. And when when they, when he brought it the first time, you know, they were just engraving stuff in the makerspace with everybody around. And Joe's like, you know, you know that stuff can bounce, right? And it's just an open frame laser <laughs> diode. Like, people could get blinded. And, you know, that's just something you have to worry about, but people don't realize. It is. It's like one of my plans was to fully enclose it. But, like, you know, you too, you don't have to. Yeah. It, it's interesting because um, it's it's a, you know w- what could what could go wrong right um, and when something goes wrong you're um, you know you can be in a world of hurt you um, you know you could have a kid come by and stick their hand under the laser or you could have a, a pet jump up on the on the bench that it's on and um, move a piece of material that may reflect differently so there's so many so many scenarios um, that um, that, that that can occur that uh, occur when the, you know the problem is that they occur when you least expect them to occur 
It's it's late mm-hmm. one night. You you're working away. You've got fifteen things that you've got to cut, and um, you've accidentally turned around and put your metal ruler underneath in in the workspace because you just you, you <laughs> rushed. And hey, I'm, I'm not I'm not saying it from from experience, but uh, you know it can happen. <laughs> huh. That sounds familiar. Neither am I. I've never done it either. <laughs> shirt caught on fire and everything (laughs) it's a good it's a good point you bring up because the the actual the most expensive part on the emblazer 2 believe it or not is the lid um it looks a lot of people look at that and say oh it's a piece of um um acrylic um it's not it's um it's a specially formulated polycarbonate that we had um developed um to not only to meet um the uh fire uh, safety regulations. So, if there is something that ignites within your machine, that lid meets um, the the different. The, the, it actually exceeds the minimum fire ratings to enclose the fire. Um, but it also has um, additives really? in that to re- to remove and filter out um, our specific wavelength of of light. So, um, out of everything on that machine, I still kick myself when I tell people that that piece of plastic on the lid is the most expensive part that that makes up that whole machine. <laughs> that's actually surprising. Yeah, especially with the custom extrusions and everything. That's yeah. a But good for you that you know, you took safety to that level cuz a lot of people don't, and a lot of companies don't. And I I think that's one of the things that I always point out to people when they're asking me like, "Well, you know, is the is the emblazer worth it?" And like, well, "Yes, because you know, I can do this and I can do this and I can do this and I can always feel comfortable that it's, it's okay. You know, I, when my CO2 laser is going, my kids are not allowed in my shop, even if everything's closed up because I built that thing. I don't know where the light leaks are, <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> but, um, you know, when we're using the E2, like we've cut bird houses and all kinds of stuff on the E2 and, and had a ton of fun. And, um, uh, yeah, we uh, we have a Glowforge at our makerspace right now, <sighs> and uh, my my daughter and her friend were the ones that commissioned that machine, and my daughter's used the E2 as well, and she thought it was you know, just as easy and just as good. Yay! Um, you know, <laughs> she she did tell me that she liked the Glowforge better because it wasn't mine. Ah, and uh, of course know, any, anything anything that is someone else's is instantly cooler than mine but you know that's because you're lame. whatever it's because yeah. it's because she's like nine <laughs> and becoming an adolescent already apparently you're a dead dude um, it's gonna get worse as they get older you're gonna get more and more <laughs> lame um so make the most of it now yeah make your level of lameness um enjoy it now because it gets worse I'm trying to stay cool. I'm trying to take her to things that she's really interested in and really support her and just like stay awesome. But you know, I know it's going to go away. Um, do you have more you want to talk about on that at all? Oh, where were we? What were we talking about? CO2? Um, <laughs> yeah. look, it, it really, it, it comes to, <laughs> I lost track. It really comes down to the right machine for the right purpose. And you know, Glowforge right. is an awesome machine. Um, you know, hands down, it's a fantastic machine. It's, it's it works. It it does it does its job well. It's it's incredibly priced. Um, annoyingly, you know what really drives me nuts? Annoyingly priced, but anyway, um, what what drives you nuts? But that machine, like, so that machine is a forty watt CO two, and the emblazer is a five watt diode. <laughs> I can engrave the same job faster on the emblazer. Than I can on the on the uh, um, Glowforge. It, it's a good it's a good point you make, and I always people ask for wattage, um, and they that's how you decide on a laser these days. You know, you, know, you want a forty watt, fifty watt, hundred watt, twenty watt. Um, it's like comparing apples and oranges. We we use a, a solid state laser which can, produces five six watts, but we do a lot of work with the optics and the beam. We actually reshape the beam to help focus it a lot, a lot more finely than what um, people who, for example, yes. the the Alex laser, 
uses a standard um, off-the-shelf uh, focusing lens. It's probably a, a three glass element lens or something like that. We mm. In the Emblazer, we have um, actually a whole uh, set of prisms and, um, and glass in there to help take the traditionally rectangular shape of a, of a laser diode beam and, um, and make that more square. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do, believe it or not, with light um, because um, light has different axes of, of, um, of, of divergence and all that sort of thing. But right. we... You know, the, the 5 watts really translates to about a 15 to 20 watt CO2. Um, so it's one of these misconceptions that you find um, is really difficult to, to overcome. Um, you see people say, oh, why would I buy a 5 watt when I can buy a 40 watt? 40 watts going to be, you know, X, X times um, 50. In my math right now, but it's going to be <laughs> a lot more powerful. Right. Um, but it really is depends on what you... Um, on what you want to use it for. If if you're not after um, producing a, you know, putting it into production, um, or you're after doing um, engraving, for example, onto organic materials, sometimes it does trump um, some of the um, features that you can get on a on a CO two machine. Um, so yeah, well, it's it's a, part of our job is 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 kind of um, um, trying to educate people and get them out of that traditional way of thinking. The the things that I've noticed, um, you know, when I'm able to compare them, apples to oranges sitting right next to each other, is um, if I have woods that engrave very lightly in my CO2 laser, um, it, it, and there's, there's tricks you can do to make your engravings darker, but the easiest trick I have is to just move it over to the emblazer because diodes seem to always engrave wood darker than co2 can ever do i don't i don't really understand why um but i have a feeling it's because of uh the stuff that you're doing with beam shaping and being able to get you can get a diode to a much finer point than you can with a co2 <clears throat> right and, and you, you can control that lower end so that you're not just vaporizing the material away you can actually discolor it you make it darker or make right. it different shades of dark before just completely vaporizing it, which is why you end up with a lighter color on CO twos. It's yeah. There's just too much too much power for that for that purpose, um, and you're just removing the material rather than um, altering its 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 color. And then the point you bring up about power is an interesting topic too, because laser power ratings are unfocused power so it's it's they're rated um at a specific distance out of the tube completely unfocused um are, are diodes rated the same way it's a bit of a it's yes yes and no um regardless of how we focus our laser um the power output doesn't change um if that makes sense so a diode right. um unfocused diode would produce the same amount of power than a focused diode, for example. But it's the effectiveness and the power per area that really comes into what makes a difference. Right. Um, so that, see, that, that kind of relative, you know, the, the 5 watt laser equates to a 15 to 20 watt CO2. Doesn't mean we're getting 15 to 20 watts out. It means our power concentration um, it gives you the same results as what you would get with a with a fifteen to twenty watt CO two machine, um, right? So it's yeah, it's it's one of these things that um, you kind of have to think about and um, and understand a little bit of physics really um, uh, to yeah. uh, to to really appreciate that that uh, what it actually means. Yeah. Lasers are really interesting. I as I've dove more into cutters uh, and, and learned more about how uh, lasers work and how the power ratings and everything are done. It's really interesting. So I've got a quick question on the diode. Sure. Um, so um, uh, you said it was about five to six watt diode. Um, is that a, uh, it's like a peak wattage or is that like constant current where you could run it at the hundred percent for however you want? 
because when I was when I was specking dial lasers for my own cutter or engraver, and most of the Chinese suppliers they would say, oh, you know, it's a five watt, four watt late diode, but that's peak current, and you can't run it for very long at at that wattage. Whereas a supplier like OPT Laser, they have a nice, like I think it's a six watt diode, and that's like straight up. You can give it full six watts, and the duty cycle is for like a good forty eight hours. Like you could just run it one hundred percent. So how does your diode work as far as that goes? It's a good question. We, um, we the five watts we produce is uh, fully sustainable um, indefinitely. I guess um, you could just run it at that at that power for um, as long as you like. Um, awesome. a, uh, we. Um, Lost my train of thought. We basically, uh, we do a lot of work with cooling the diode down. Um, and laser diodes produce a lot of heat. For a little device the size of a pea, um, um, you'd be amazed at how much heat they produce. So a big part of managing that is to be able to um, keep the diode cool enough so it doesn't self-destroy itself. Um, so the five watts, our, our diodes, we could run at potentially we could run them at seven to eight watts um, for wow. a very small period of time um, before they will just burn themselves out. It, it, it's like a light bulb that all of a sudden goes massively bright and then burns its filament out. So the diodes are capable of, of a lot more than, than what um, we put through them. We've come up with that um, five six watt power. It, it, it varies. They go between five to six watt six watts. It depends on the, you know, it's an individual thing on the diode itself. Mm -hmm. um, and you can just run those. We we have jobs that we run for. Um, I think the longest job we've run has been eighteen hours, um, just continuously, oh, nice. um, just doing a massive engraving that just was super fine detail and just. Um, yeah, we just ran those. But heat is definitely the killer for diets, um, and which is why on the Emblazer um, 2, you see we've got that uh, custom-designed uh, um, die-cast aluminium heat sink, which um, mm -hmm. was really cleverly designed in, um, in CAD with um, heat flow analysis and all, all sort of things that, you, that um, you need to do to make sure that something's um, working, um, working what it, uh, doing what it should be doing. So, yeah, you'll find one thing you've got to be careful of. You'll see um, people advertising diodes um, on, on eBay saying it's a 10-watt diode. Um, and unfortunately, they don't do their oh, math. Yeah. They don't do their math right because they, they assume that um, the power of a diode is based on the current that comes in, uh, based on the voltage in the current. But it, it, mm -hmm. it, it's not. It's actually the power of a diode... Um, is the amount of light that comes out. So the, the only way to really work out the power of a diode is to use a light meter to, to measure it. Um, you, hmm. can't, you can't just do electrical calculations and say, hey, wait a second, you know, I've got a 200-watt diode because I'm putting in you know, <laughs> 10 volts and, uh, <laughs> and, and 20 amps, and it's, uh, it's amazing. Um, so yeah, there's, a lot, there's a lot of things that, um, yeah, a lot of misconceptions out there with a lot of things, just, just kind of, be, be careful of it, but I would definitely recommend if you have a company that sounds like they know what they're talking about, with um, with um, giving you some facts and reasons why this is sustainable at this voltage, then they obviously know what they're doing. Yeah, thank you. That's well, okay. you sure sound like you know what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm gonna believe. I just read that off. Uh, you know, someone wrote that for me. I just read that off. Uh, <laughs> You it's a, it's, it real quick. it's amazing it's the with PR light. department. <laughs> yeah, it, it was on the it was on the bottle of my Swindler Tropical Ale, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how much we keep learning about light. Um, we one of the most amazing things that um, is with uh, light is that you think of uh, light light travels um, in a in a um, you know the light coming out of a of a diode is. Um, straight, like it's, a, it's just like a conical shape that comes out. It, it's actually not. It's actually shaped like a wine, um, you know, it's, it's like an hourglass shape. So light okay. actually huh. um, comes out and curves into a, to a waist, which is where the best focus point is. And then after the waist, it curves away just like an hourglass. 
um, pretty, pretty amazing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now we've, we've had the, uh, the beam waste discussion at the makerspace a few times. On right. Why, why you can't cut things with a 38 millimeter lens on our, uh, K40 is like, it just won't work. It's, <laughs> beam waste. it's, it's too fat. <laughs> but, but is that a fat so with a pH? Better. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. All right. So, um, I love this discussion, but we're running out of time for how long we like to make the podcast. I've got more questions. Okay, I'll answer um, quick. I know. So how um, how is the maker world in Australia different than the maker world in the U.S.? Like, Good question. I, I loved living in the U.S. Um, when I was there this between 2000 and 2010 uh, because you could pretty much decide to do something and then get in a car and go to like um bunning uh, not bunnings go to a, a you know osh hardware store we have those. <laughs> something like that and just buy whatever you needed so um the, the maker the maker culture here is is kind of not as developed as it is in the u.s but it's getting better um i, I kind of get the feeling it's still considered a little bit for kids or for your nerds, you know, your real hardcore people, it hasn't been adapted as 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 much as mainstream as it has in the US. Um, okay, but it is getting better all the time, um, and you know, a big part of it is what we're learning from the US, the products that are coming out of there, the things that are making it so much easier to to jump in and do and do stuff without having to um, become a an electronics expert or a um, you know, programming experts. So um, I, I think we're still quite a few years back. Um, I'm not sure whether we will ultimately catch up. Um, our market here is quite small. Um, you know, the US is just such a massive market with such a diverse cross-section of people. But um, I hope we will. I hope we'll, um, we'll kind of get there and be able to people just jump in and feel like it's, you know, they're not... Um, <laughs> they don't have to hide away in, in the room and, and, and work on things and feel like it's uncool. It's it's kind of become yeah. really cool in the States, I think. You know, it's cool to be a maker. I don't know. Would yes. you would it's you cool agree with that? It's cool to be a nerd now. Yeah, it, it's cool to be a nerd now, which oh. is just weird. <laughs> it's just which weird sucks. to me. All, all the jocks dress <laughs> like nerds, and I'm like, you. it's cultural appropriation, guys. You can't do that. <laughs> like all the girls just wear giant thick rimmed glasses right. it's nerdy and, and yeah it's cute but yeah i like marvel marvel's <laughs> cool yeah i'm a nerd uh-huh you talk to talk man <laughs> <laughs> yeah it it's uh the makerspace scene here has been really fun over the last few years because um like people like me and aaron are we we finally found our people oh yeah and and uh, it's like you go to the makerspace and like you never have to feel left out because everybody's there for the same thing. And you're just like, I love all of you. <laughs> Where were you 20 years ago <laughs> or 10 years ago? But it's pretty great. Bring some so, of the, bring um, some of that our way. I'd love to, you don't know how bad I want to come to Australia. I'd like, I feel like I would die by like all the things that can kill you oh, in yeah. Australia. Yeah. Well, it's a dangerous it, place. It, that that that's my next question. <laughs> in a land where everything <laughs> wants you to die, how have you made it this how has the country made it this long? There's super, <laughs> super humans over there. Oh yeah. boy. Yeah. You know, gravity is like five times normal here, so we're we're just <laughs> It's really funny. Like you, you asked that question, and and I, I listened to an audio book recently called Death World um, by Harry Harrison. I don't know if you've heard, you should look it up. It's about this guy who ends a gambler who ends up on a planet called Death World, and pretty much everything on the planet is designed to kill you. You know, if you if okay. you um, left the planet for a few weeks, when you came back um, to the planet, you had to actually be re-inducted on surviving on that planet. It's, it's just an amazing story, but. Um, it's, it's really a tough question. Um, 
Look, just not in, not in any seriousness, seriousness at all. Um, I don't know if you can hear my dog in the background there. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. That's um, fine. But you know, something something like being in a more immortal is kind of dull. You know, just being able to um, survive stuff is you know that's a pretty boring way to um, way to go. But um, do you guys remember Get Smart? Mm-hmm. Remember there was this agent um, called Simon the Likable. And he was just this guy that um, he was a he was a bad guy, chaos agent. And he, um, when he smiled, you just couldn't help but like him. He just had, you know, they put this little twinkle on his teeth, and um, he just instantly, you know, even if he was about to kill you, um, he had this just most infectious smile. So, I think I think what the you know, if I had to look at some sort of um, way of surviving here, I think the the, the superpower I'd probably um, have would be like the ability of not being considered a threat so I think that's <laughs> <laughs> so you know that's even down to the molecular level so right well I mean you're like your spiders are big enough to be intelligent so <laughs> like they probably have personalities I don't know if you've heard that stick I've been waving around but there's, there's been a few crocodiles <laughs> creeping up on me and <laughs> The kangaroos just, you know, usually the kangaroos take care of the crocodiles, but it's pretty hot here today. I, I don't know where they're at. Um, awesome. are, are are all the kangaroos like completely ripped and super muscly? Absolutely. In real life there. Yeah. I um, see some it, terrifying photos I mean, of kangaroos on the internet. <laughs> I mean, you'd be too, Joe, if you jumped around all everywhere. <laughs> exactly. I do. <laughs> it's all no, the you walk. You have to jump drink. with two feet and hop. <laughs> You'd be just as jacked. And, hey, like, punch. <laughs> you, you guys aren't too far off, thing. You guys have got some pretty deadly animals down your way, too, right? No, the only thing that really wants to kill us where Aaron and I are is we have these spiders called brown recluses. Oh, yeah. And, uh, they're white. And when they bite you, uh, the skin just dies all it around just, it. It just and, rots. Ooh, yeah, ouch. it just rots away in, like, days. So, wow. like, you, you know you got bit, and then, like, a day or a half later, you have this, like, baseball-sized necrotic tissue that they have to then excavate out and hope you don't get gangrene. Um, but if you go a few hours south, we have rattlesnakes and cottonmouths, four or five species of venomous snakes and more venomous spiders, but yeah, nothing, that, that's nothing what compared I'm talking to you about. guys. We also have crippling depression. <laughs> <laughs> That's the real killer. Uh, we got that as well. <laughs> We've got this um, yes. blue ring, blue ring octo- uh, blue ring octopus. That um, this is a little titchy, cute little thing, and if it stings you, it basically paralyzes you. So it won't kill you, but um, if someone gets stung by them, you basically have to give them mouth to mouth and CPR until the venom wears off. Um, oh my God. I just find that so scary. Um, and that, you know, you just find them around rock pools at, um, on the beaches and <laughs> yeah, just nice fun stuff. Well, and then you guys have like huntsman spiders and all kinds of crazy spiders and some really interesting ways to die with snakes and, ah, uh, scorpions. God, I want to come to Australia. No, so bad. Everything's so neat. So neat. <laughs> <laughs> I like a good challenge. <laughs> I, I just i've I've been into reptiles my whole life, and everything I love is from Australia. Like you guys have um, uh, fly river turtles, which are so cool. You guys have like four species of lungfish, which are really neat when you go inland. Um, yeah. uh, so many cool things. You know more about anyway. it than me, and I and I have yeah. to fight them off every day. <laughs> <laughs> All the way in stick just. Oh, and you guys have parentes and lace monitors. Like, if I came and visited you guys, I, the whole time I'd just be like, "Can we go find a parenti somewhere?" Look, if I you come, and, it. if you come and visit us, <laughs> I'll you can stay at my place, and I will fill the room with any deadly, venomous <laughs> creature you want. You name it, just pick five. Let's keep it to five, um, and and they're yours. You just I'll get in the room, I'll close the door. You won't know where they're at. Um, but <laughs> you, you can go crazy with them. Uh, everything I'd pick, I'd probably know where it's at. They're pretty big. 
All right. So my last question, <laughs> so we can wrap this madness up. <laughs> um, what's next for Darkly? Wait, wait, what's your guys' next big project? And then, like, what are you hoping for in the next five years? We're actually just about to release a new machine called the Emblazer 2 Core, um, C-O-R-E. And what we did was when we moved from the Emblazer 1, which was a kit that, um, you know, a lot of makers could, could um, uh, buy and afford and put together and went to the Emblazer 2 uh, with a fully built machine that was, you know, pretty much went up quite a bit in price. We lost a lot of that um, that demographic of the market so we're we're about to release um of an emblazer 2 that's a kit so it's Ooh, it's still a man. it's a class 4 laser but it uses all the electronics all the optics all the technology that we have for the emblazer 2 so performance wise you'll be able to get the same level of cutting you'll have your z-axis control you have your workspace camera your air assist um, these things Ooh. will all be options that you can buy immediately or purchase later and add in. Um, so that's that's about I to like be it. released pretty soon. Um, we are always working on impl- improving the current machine, so maybe there might be an Emblazer 3 on the way, uh, maybe much higher power, um, hitting a lot of the different things that um, we are fighting against with our CO2 machines. So that's uh, that's mm-hmm. definitely something we always have in the background. Um, and, yeah, look, we're, we're education market is, our, is one of our biggest markets, schools and teachers and students. And we um, are always working on different products that can complement our machines in the education market. So pretty soon we'll be bringing out some um, different types of um, accessories that you could purchase along with your machine to to either you know for a classroom environment, say STEM kits or projects, products, th- those sort of things that will help make um, life easier for for educators. Very that's, cool. It's a very quick response, but that kind of gives you a gives you a direction mm-hmm. of where we're going. Yeah, uh, a quick response means that it's true. <laughs> you, you didn't just make it up <laughs> i am super excited for the kit yeah for, i uh, am too yeah because uh like i said earlier i was about to design my own but like if i can just buy a, an emblazer 2 kit without all the fancy safety measures that's, well, and- that's right up my alley and for those guys that don't know, the the main difference between a class two or a class one and a class four is um, is the safety features. So a class one, you don't need any safety devices. You can just you know use the device as is, and you're free from light leaks and and any dangers like that. And a class four is essentially a handgun on a stick. <laughs> It's, it's not that. It's not that bad. <laughs> it's, not that, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. But that's it, when you're in the industrial world, and they're and you tell somebody that you want to put a class four device inside a workshop that you're going to let other people use. They that's what they look at you like you just said. But no, it, it means that um, later laser radiation is potentially available. Is that a good way of saying it? It means that you can that you can no. access the access the laser. Right? Be, I, be right. it either you can interact with it or it can interact with you. So um, right. <laughs> and I wouldn't really I call like it. I, I wouldn't really call it a, a handgun. It sounds comparison. much more personable that way. Like, <laughs> my laser is so personal; it'll interact with me. Yes. Uh, but there, maybe, but, maybe. but yeah, sorry. We are we are working on ways around that. So there'll be you know, for example, an enclosure that we that um, can be can be part of that mix as well. So um, oh, nice. We are looking at the tech, uh, tech um, resolving these safety issues. Awesome. Well, and they're well, they are safety issues. They're not necessarily safety things that can't be gotten around. You know, with, like, with eye, proper eye protection, yeah. proper eye protection, Goggles. and you know, proper precautions taken. The machine's perfectly safe to use. It's exactly. just you you have to have those things in mind when you use it. Exactly. And, and uh, yeah, and as you know, when you design something, you have to 
you have to design for the worst possible scenario. So, which is yeah. why, you know, things just get very complex um, often. So by simplifying this and putting a little bit of the onus onto the customer, there, there are big savings that, um, that can be made on, on the product. Awesome. Um, do you have a, a thought on when that could come out? It's in production at the moment. We have machines out with some of our beta testers at the moment, and everything is very promising. Um, since it's using the same um, electronics and technology that we have in the E2, it's uh, it's not a you know machine designed from the ground up. So we have um, we know that that works and that works really well. Um, we are basically at the moment completing the um, instruction manual and the and the associated um, documents that go along with it, and we're looking cool. at um, early. Uh, possibly even January in 2019 in making Ooh. a big announcement and making that available. Awesome. Awesome. We'll have to get one in, in, um, in your guys' head so you can have a play with it. Yes. I was actually we, just talking in Slack today about yeah, using a laser engraver to uh, uh, cut away the foam at the top of a, a, a pint of beer. <laughs> Someone linked some crazy machine that had like a stupid app that you could like take a selfie and it will engrave it into your Guinness, like into the head of foam. Wow. I'm like, I could probably do that with a, with a laser. That's amazing. So, we, so I mean, we, we could yeah. almost certainly do that with a laser and light burn and, you know, a couple yeah. hours at the makerspace. That could be a yeah. hackathon project. I was actually, I, I, I was. I was maybe going to attempt it tomorrow with the LX maker. <laughs> I seem to get the LX maker up high enough. So it's like on top of yeah. the beer at the right thing. I'd love to see the results of that. Um, you've got to post that. If pass or fail, we're just going to see you do this. Um, <laughs> I totally will. Yeah. Well, but, did you see our laser dog that we posted this summer? Yeah. <laughs> so that was, yeah, for 4th of July, I was trying to hold new PR thing for the makerspace because our current our current PR officer hasn't done Jack. But <laughs> Jay <laughs> calling you out. No, we so left. I, I, we I tried a whole Facebook uh, social media thing and I took the LX maker that I have and I I engraved hashtag laser dog on a on, on a, a brat. <laughs> nice. And I did like a whole I did like a whole slew of uh of uh of trials. So I tried engraving it before putting on the grill and then seeing how they turned out. And then I tried, you know, engraving them after I grilled them. And the best was, if you care for uh, laser engraved hot dogs. Yeah, things, of course we do. You, you engrave it first and then you grill it. Right. Cause then okay. it, it accentuates like the, the, dark the engraving. That's fantastic yeah. because we tried doing bread and um, bread works I, better when you toast it first and then engrave it. We found um, I did. really so I did that too, and I did not try toasting it. Yeah, lightly toasting it, and then maybe finishing it off with the final toasting. Interesting. Um, yeah, but yeah, oh, that's excellent. I, I, I like that. Uh, let us know how you go with the beer. We'll we'll post that. <laughs> we'll post that as well for you. Yeah, definitely <laughs> done. Yeah, we. I've done sugar cookies, but that's as far as I've taken yeah. it. So we had the, the well, guys here uh, experiment with stuff, and we've always thought of doing a. Um, uh, using a laser to um, melt sugar, so you can lay sugar out and laser over it and melt it and form almost form toffee um, with with yeah. the laser cutter. But we've never gone as far as testing it. So we did uh, sugar SLS at the makerspace. Right? How did that work? And it's pretty dope. Shockingly well. Oh, it tasted awful. Shockingly awful, well. It was a uh, it was difficult. Um, the, the guy that was actually doing it, he built a uh, like a like a sugar shaker, kind of like a salt shaker, but it was like super high output. Yep, and it was mounted and, on the air assist nozzle of our K four D laser. Oh, yeah, that's it was cool. Awesome. I like that. It was custom G code where <laughs> it would it would it would it would uh, it would uh, cut the layer like like you know melt the sugar in a layer, then custom G code to. Then shake the shaker across the layer, 
That's classic. And then even at the beginning and end of the job, like there's he had like some weird little dingus that stuck out to open and close the shaker. Oh, so yeah. it would like go to a random lead screw that was sticking out and then just like open up the shaker. Then at the end of the job, it would then go back and just like uh, mechanically, you know, run across the lead screw and, and close it. It, that's it was awesome. pretty great. It that's was super awesome. cool thing ever. Uh, we made a like just like a 20 millimeter uh, cube, hollow cube thing, and it worked shockingly well. So. <laughs> hmm, some ideas are maybe, brewing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we'll have to try this again. So, all right. Well, with that, um, we are currently rivaling the E3D episode for time. So yeah. we should probably uh, call it. No, that's great. It's I love when episodes run long because we can't stop talking to each other. It's uh yeah. It, it's my favorite. But with that, is do you have anything you want to add, Dominic? No, look, this has been a lot of fun. Um thanks for having me on, guys. Um it's just been yeah, it's been a great um a great chat. Well, with that, uh Again, look for us on all of our social medias. We've got Twitter now, which is exciting. Uh, Instagram, Facebook, subreddit. All of them are makers on tap um, at their respective places. And uh, you know, let us know future topics. If you want to be interviewed, you've got something cool that you want to talk about. We're happy to have you on the show. Um, but yeah, with that, uh, this is Joe. And Aaron. Uh, Keep making stuff. Keep making stuff. <laughs> quit, quit stealing my outro. <laughs> I'm the host, man. All right, guys. Thank you for being on. This is the end of the podcast. <laughs>